Welcome to Bomb Splained. Today I'm going to explain how apertures and depth of field work, and I'm going to show you some demonstrations and some drawings. So let's jump in. So an aperture is something that sits either just in front of or just behind a lens and closes down or widens to allow more light in or to keep it out. Works just like a person's eye. And here's how an aperture works in a camera lens. You can see it's going in and out. So why is it that when an aperture closes down, it doesn't crop out the image? It's kind of hard to explain in words, so I'm going to draw it out and then I'm going to show you a live demonstration. So if you have a lens and a light source, in this case a candle, you'll see that the rays of light hit all around and some of them hit the lens. The ones that hit the lens are focused back down into a focused point, which hits the ideally the film plane. Now if we draw in the aperture, which basically blocks the outer edges of the lens, you'll see that those rays coming through don't make it anymore. And that's why the image becomes dimmer. It's also why more of the image is sharper, which I'm going to show you in the later part of this video on depth of field. So let's look at it in real life. So what I've set up is a candle, a magnifying glass, and a white box. And I put them in the dark. The candle light is going through the second largest lens on the magnifying glass, the one to the middle right. You can see as I move the candle backward and forward that the flame is in sharper focus and fuzzier focus. I've cut out three circles out of black masking tape to simulate apertures on a camera lens. The first one that I'm applying right now is the biggest. Watch the brightness on the right hand side of the screen. And also notice that you can see the entire image of the flame still, even though I'm blocking off a portion of the magnifying glass. Okay, same thing with the second smallest hole. i put that over. And again, you can still see the entire flame. It's yet again darker. And finally, I'm putting the very smallest hole over the magnifying glass. And you can see it's just really a pinhole in size, but you can still see the entire flame and it's darker overall, just as you would expect from what I drew out on the drawing. Let's look at the two flames side by side. The one on the left is with nothing on the magnifying glass. The one on the right is with the smallest aperture. can still see the entire image, but it's a lot dimmer. So things to get a handle on. A large aperture is the smallest number on the ring of your camera, so f2.8 for example. So that's a wider aperture. Um, it's a wider cone from the lens to the focus area to the light source. Smaller aperture is f32, for example. It's the largest number in the ring, but if you look at the actual aperture while you have it set that way, it's the smallest opening. So first of all, it would be really convenient if the nerds that determined the f-stop numbering system hadn't made the smaller number the widest aperture and the larger number the smaller aperture. And just no matter how long I've done this and done photography, I have to stop and think about that and make that mental conversion. So if that's not confusing enough for you, let me draw some things out for you to talk about depth of field and why it's affected by the aperture or f-stop. So let's draw it out. Let's say you have two identical lenses, one set to a large aperture and one set to a small aperture. We'll draw the visible light coming into each lens in red. You can see that the light enters at the same angle. Then if we draw the cone of light being allowed past the aperture in dashed black lines, you'll see that the larger aperture on top, which is using more of the lens to allow in light, has a wider angle down to the focus point where the two black dashed lines cross. The small aperture on the bottom lens creates a more acute angle, which means it intersects the visible light much farther away. Where the black dashed lines intersect the red is where the image will be in perceived sharpness. You can see that the larger aperture has a much narrower depth of field than the smaller. Another way to think about it is that the top lens, with its more open aperture, is bending more rays of light at sharper angles, and those rays coming in from the periphery of the lens are more distorted or blurry. 
the narrower rays being allowed past the smaller aperture are straighter and therefore more representative of the entire scene in focus. Here's a grid that might help. And remember, the reason the f-stop number seems to be larger when in fact the opening is smaller is because it's the denominator of a fraction. So sports and wildlife photographers crave the fastest lens possible, meaning a lens that lets in the most light possible, so that they can capture a fast moving object in lower light and be more likely to get the shot in focus. That's why you see those ginormous lenses on the sidelines of sporting events. So a fast lens is usually considered f2.8 or smaller number. So here's one whose largest aperture is f3.5. And here's one that's about the same equivalence in zoom or focal length, but it's got a wider aperture capability of 2.8. So that matches the physics that the more light being gathered provides more errors in focus, and that's why they call this a faster lens, and it's why it's substantially more expensive. So that's my explainer video. I hope this has helped you to visualize how apertures and depth of field work. Check out my bomb reviews for reviews of cool stuff that still works. I think you'll find those interesting too.